Taylor Swift in, you know, creates music and builds joy in the people who listen to it and then invites them to buy things, right? <laughs> Whereas in the crypto space, we invite people to buy things and then find an emotional attachment to the financial assets they just got, right? I would not throw some random dudes from Texas and North Carolina and Wyoming in a group chat and say we're homies simply because we all own US dollars. <laughs> Welcome back to The Observation. We are in studio today with Evan McMullen, and we have a great show prepared for you. But before we dive into the podcast, I have to shout out to our sponsors, Cash App. The Observation is powered by Cash App. When personal finance meets your funds and the stuff that matters, that's money, that's Cash App. Download the app, buy Bitcoin, not financial advice. Okay, Evan McMullen, she is the CEO and co-founder of Disco, also Web3 Baddie. Welcome to The Observation. GM, GM Ops, thank you so much for having me today. It is a joy to be here. I have been looking forward to this podcast for a while, and we have a lot to talk about today. I, I don't even know where to start because we get wild. So everyone, you know, just buckle up. I don't even know. To, I don't know how to prepare you for this podcast because we're going everywhere today. Um, Welcome to the metaverse. Yes. So glad that you've joined us. Please, the, Aubrey, where should we go first? The multiverse, potentially. Hyperverse? Um, <laughs> the the obsverse, the discoverse. Um, I think people might not know one of the most interesting people in Web3, and that is Evan. And so I wanted to actually take it back to like how interesting of a person you are. And even, even you and I, we've been friends for over a year, and I did not know this about you until we, we had brunch at Waverly Inn, shout out to Waverly Inn, uh, this weekend. And Evan told me that she knows George Bush on like a kind of a personal level. <laughs> true or not true? That That <laughs> is true. Yeah. I. Uh, so a funny thing about <laughs> me is that when I get excited about an idea, when I get interested in something, like I let it swallow me whole. It becomes an <laughs> all-consuming obsession. And for me, you know, when I was a kid, that was like the environment, the world around me. I grew up in a teeny town in the middle of nowhere in Ohio. And when I was in school, I thought that a lot of things that we were learning, like in elementary school, were really lame. When I was in fourth <laughs> grade, we had to learn about the life cycle of fish. We were learning about the Alaskan salmon. And I thought, I live in Ohio. This is ridiculous and irrelevant. Why can't, you know, why can't we do better? Why can't we do something else? Why can't we learn about something that's more fun? And so that kind of set me off on a path of like an obsession with changing the science curriculum and making, you know, the experiences that we had in the classroom relevant and interesting to our lives around us. And then I learned about watersheds and fish and environmental science. And basically, long story short, I got really into understanding how ecosystems work how dependency between species creates interoperable systems that you know are self-perpetuating. Um, so basically, as a teenager, I was really into fish, understanding how the environment <laughs> worked, trying to preserve it, to get other people to care about it. And so that landed me um, the, envi the President's Environmental Youth Award uh, when I was in high school. And so I had the opportunity to go to the White House and meet George W. Bush to discuss environmental policy. So you were basically Greta Thunberg before Greta was on the scene, but for Ohio. You that, saved Ohio. That is one of the <laughs> kindest things that everyone has ever said to me. Anyone has ever said to me, really, like, when I started working on this stuff in, you know, the late 90s, really, like, early 2000s, the sort of green movement wasn't a, didn't a even trend. Exist yet. Didn't it wasn't exist. exist. Like the idea that, you know, you would recycle a can at my high school was something that no one had ever heard of. We didn't think about sustainability or the carbon footprint of anything. So what what drove you to that? Because you were like learning about the Alaskan salmon. You're like, well, this isn't really relevant to me. I would like to learn about things in Ohio. And was that it? Or were you just like this, I'm being, were you in public school? Is this private school? So like what is, where are you at? I was in public school. Okay. And Same. Shout I, out to public school kids. Yeah. Shout out public school kids. Um, so I started in, in public school and then due to some of the stories that I'm going to share with you, ended up in private school. <laughs> um, but so, you know, I, I had, there were a lot of experiences when I was a kid where I felt like, you know, the teachers were not teaching us something interesting and relevant. So, you know, for example, like in fourth grade in my English class, uh, you know, I had read all, I read all the books pretty quickly and I was being <laughs> disruptive in class. And so my teacher just kicked me out in the hall. And so a few weeks later, the principal finds me like kicking a soccer ball around the hallway. 
and is like, Evan, what are you doing? You are nine or whatever. (laughs) And so they call my parents in and they're like, look, you know, Evan is a hardworking kid. She's, you know, thoughtful and smart. And we think that she needs some additional activities to keep her occupied. And so we're going to let her sit out in the hallway every day and read a book of her choice. And she can do little reports on what those books are. And that'll keep her from being disruptive. So being the normal fourth grade child in Ohio that I was, I thought the first book I'll read is Animal Farm from George Orwell. And then I'll take a refrigerator box from my parents' new fridge and I'll make a puppet, uh, you know, like a little puppet theater and I'll do a sock puppet um, demonstration for my fourth grade class about the Bolshevik Revolution. Oh my God. Cool. And, you know, I read books about the Iditarod and got my classmates to guess on which dog sled was going to win, you know, for candy prizes. And then, you know, it was sort of around that time that I started realizing, well, my science class is kind of lame too. What else can we do there? (laughs) And so, you know, I I started learning about, okay, what are the other, outside of, you know, fish in Alaska, like what is something that's near us that we could touch and see? Because there's a stream in the front yard of the house where I grew up. There's a stream in the yard of the school where I attended. And so then I started, you know, I started asking my teachers, why can't we learn about this? Well, they said, there's no book about that. So I said, okay, I'll write one. And so I got a grant to write a textbook that would adhere to the state standards required of science education, but would use examples that we could see in our yards. And I got grant funding to purchase fish tanks for classrooms. I um, went to a fish hatchery and got brown trout eggs and took them to these, you know, kids' classrooms so they could follow along and, you know, release the fish in the local environment when they grew up, um, at, you know, toward the later end of the semester. Um, I spent A year in high school, when my friends were like learning how to drive and going on dates, (laughs) going over to the fish hatchery at the local boys school to tend to my 10,000 brown trout so I could study their behavior as it related to temperature changes. Um, And so then I thought, okay, well, you know, now we're teenagers, we've been learning about this, we can do something about it. And so then I started getting grants to plant hundreds of thousands of trees in our local community so that we could create a healthy ecosystem for these fish and the other sensitive species that live there. Um, I worked with some younger students to help uh, the spotted salamander become the state amphibian of Ohio so that everyone in every classroom would have to learn about our backyards. I love that you have never asked for permission. You just did those things. Like no one... No one, you just did all those things. You didn't ask anybody. I mean, did you ask or were you like, I'm just going to write a book. I'm just going to make the state amphibian of Ohio. When I think about that, like, I am so (laughs) grateful to my parents for always responding, you know, well, you can try. They never told me that I could, well, actually, there were a few things that I wasn't allowed to do. Well, your parents are lawyers, right? Yeah, my parents are lawyers, and, you know, so when I was a kid, like, they're they're pretty strict. Like, I couldn't, you know, watch television. I couldn't read Seventeen magazine or use lipstick or, you know, things like like that. like, good people. (laughs) But when I was in grade school, Napster became popular. Um, Actually, at one point, uh, Sean Parker was living in my uncle's guest room, but we can talk about that later. (laughs) Um, But uh, so, you know, the Rio music player came out probably around like 2002, maybe it was a little handheld pre iPod. Yeah, I wanted to be able to download MP3s to listen to them like my friends. And my father's an intellectual property attorney was, you know, very concerned about this file sharing. And so in order to be allowed to download MP3s or share them with my friends, I had to make a presentation to my parents about the fair use statute and why my educational non-commercial use of these songs by listening to them alone in my bedroom was legal and why I should be allowed to do so. And did you, was this a deck? What did you do, a PowerPoint presentation? So was this a this report? Was in, yeah, the, so this, I think might have done it in like Microsoft Creative Writer. If you remember, that was like a kid's program from the late 90s and early 2000s. There was definitely some curls, MT, and papyrus fonts involved. (laughs) Um, But yeah, you know, my my parents have always sort of had a very, encouraged a lot of inquisitiveness in me. Yeah. Um, And they're huge nerds too. Like, you know, they wrote scholarly articles together when I was a kid um, and, you know, would make us like, 
understand legal terms to be allowed to do the same stuff that our, our friends did. So I really am grateful to them for pushing me to ask, you know, why something is the way it is or whether, you know, whether I could answer my own questions by simply giving it a try. So how did that feel growing up? Did you feel different than a bunch of your peers because you were kind of a little bit ahead of them in terms of like interest? You had a lot of adult interest. I was the weirdest little kid. <laughs> like what nine-year-old thinks like we're going to do a sock puppet show on the Bolsheviks as a but way to- was that to... sad? Was that lonely? Like do you no, have I a bunch of friends? I had the best time. I oh, okay. had wonderful friends okay, who good. are still my close friends good. today. And in fact, actually one of the things that I am you know, most proud of is that some of my wonderful friends who I've known since I was a little kid, I have the opportunity to work with today in Web3 so because, cool. you know, when I got obsessed with Bitcoin, they- would have the patience to listen to me. Yeah. And now years later, they've joined the party. Um, and so being the weird kid who's really excited about things is not cool sometimes, but for some people, earnestness is okay. And those are the people that I want in my life. Evan, so like wholesome, you so sweet. Um, speaking of like the curiosity side, you know, when you came to find Bitcoin was through a professor that introduced it to you. And was that sort of your first like introduction into any type of like cryptography at all? Yeah. Or, well, so, or actually a or little, was there little background yeah. there. So my cousin, Ilanka Dunin is an incredible cryptographer. She's a baddie. Now she's a <laughs> consultant and, you know, has a military background, does all sorts of cool stuff. But for fun, she likes to crack the codes of James Sanborn sculptures. Um, these sculptures are outside of famous buildings such as the NSA. And when I was a little kid, she would take me to visit the Sanborn sculptures. So and cool. actually Dan Brown, the author, wrote a character about her based on her, wow. who is a code breaker, which is super cool. And so, you know, when I was in middle school, I would go to, you know, swim practice wearing my NSA sweatshirt proudly because <laughs> I thought that, you know, that that was just the coolest thing ever, that you could write secret codes and other people could learn messages from them. So that was really the, my first exposure to understanding the existence of something like cryptography was through beautiful art. Mm. And then when I went away to school, I was, you know, this nerd from Ohio surrounded by all of these well-traveled, wealthy, influential, accomplished, super cool, well-dressed people. And I felt a little lost. Mm. I, you know, I grew up on a farm with sheep and I had never been to New York City before, you know, and I was at this, you know, fancy school in the Northeast, just outside of New York. Um, and so one day, one of my friends brought me with him into a senior computer science class. I was nervous to go in because I said, we're not allowed to be here. We're, they're not going to let us stay. And he said, no, 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 like we can, we can be here. And maybe if they ask us to leave, we'll go. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll try this. So we walked in and the professor was this woman, Elizabeth Stark, who is like the greatest teacher in the world of all time. And like my biggest role model on this planet. But at the time, you know, she was a 20 something computer science teacher. And I was a 19 year old from Ohio who had never spoken out loud in a class before. And like in, in, in college. And so not only did she let us stay, but she would take us, you know, she would come to dinner with us in the dorms afterwards and talk us through what we didn't understand. She wouldn't make us, you know, just do problem sets or read textbooks, but she would bring in her friends to tell us about what they were building. So she brought in Aaron Schwartz to talk to us about the importance of freedom of information. She brought in Alexis Ohanian, who was at the time building a love project Alexis. called Bread Pig. <laughs> hey, Alexis, we love you. Um, building a project called Bread Pig and, um, and Hipmunk, which was yeah. a, a travel search tool. Um, and people like Moot, who started 4chan, Chris Poole. Um, and so she showed us, you know, these nerdy kids who were really on a trad fine consulting track, showed us what entrepreneurs were. Mm -hmm. and taught us about free and open source software and creative commons licenses and the legal wrappers we can use to make data more free. And she helped us sneak into the Yale Law School Information Society project so we could listen to Jack Balkin lecture. And that opened up a whole world to me that I didn't even know existed. 
So that's, you know, I was probably 19 or 20 when I started reading about, you know, works of people like Larry Lessig and Clay Shirky, Tim Wu and Jonathan Zittrain, who are like my Mount Rushmore of, of, you know, leaders at this point in my career. But at the time, you know, they were like these future seers. Mm. Um, and so I am so grateful because it is through that experience, you know, that, that I learned about Bitcoin. And it was also around that time that the Arab Spring was happening. Mm. And so we had nations like Tunisia basically shutting off access to the internet. And at the same time, you know, Stark taught us about fire chat, these applications that used Bluetooth networks to create censorship resistant communication abilities. And when I learned about Bitcoin, I thought it was just the coolest thing ever because two people without asking anyone else for permission could communicate with each other, could transact. Um, and so because I had this amazing professor welcome me into this space and help me feel confident and asking questions about it when I didn't understand and, and starting to play with, you know, these, these technologies, like I never got the memo that this space wasn't for me. Mm. And so I, you know, excitedly then spent m now more than a decade showing up at hackathons and jumping into the comments on Reddit and you know, trying to find a way forward with these technologies that made sense to me, but in a way where I felt like this space was was for me and I felt empowered to welcome other people into it too. So cool. Also, Elizabeth Stark is just a legend. Like this, the whole story gives me goosebumps because you know she was just trying to do the best for all of you and just try to give you the best experience possible. And she was pulling every every lever and every tool to give you that experience. And you still remember it today. And I think that's so important too when you're bringing people in is how you really make them feel. And it's like a lasting impact, obviously, on you and your career today, which Absolutely. is just amazing. Like psychological safety is something that she provided me, right? She created a space where it was safe for us to ask hard questions and learn about these technologies that was a lot gentler and a lot more informative than someone learning on Twitter today, for example. Totally. And that group of us who were in her class, like we're still here. Yeah. You know, one of the guys who sat next to me in class led Disco's round. Another so cool. one is the head of product with one of our partners who I've had the opportunity to work with now for six years on this stuff. So cool. You know, another, you know, another student in our class I spoke to earlier today about his incredible Cardano NFT, you know, collection <laughs> and his next direction. And so not only did we have a really cool place to discover this technology, but, you know, we found our band of misfits and we've been kicking it ever since. So what was it? Was it the censorship resistant element that really spoke to you? Because it seems like that is strikes a chord with you so quite a bit. Or was it something else that was just really compelling? I think the censorship resistance was the first thing that made me realize, huh, this is a different system than the others that I'm familiar with. Maybe it's worth learning more about how it works. Mm. And so really it was when I learned about Ethereum and smart contracts that I started to get excited about the kind of experiences we could have as humans mm. enabled by these protocols. Um, so when I was a kid also, I, like, I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of TV, but one of my you know, favorite things, and I still watch it today actually, it's on HBO, FYI, The Jetsons, this cartoon TV show about a family in the future where they fly around in spaceships and they don't wait in lines and they don't fill out forms. They just move from one space to another and the world responds to them and their preferences and their abilities. And that's the kind of future I've always imagined in my head. And through my career, I've worked in a variety of human-centered design practices and hardware and software to try to make more connected experiences possible. But it is through these decentralized technologies that I think we can get to a real metaverse, one where you can show up in any digital or physical environment and receive a personalized experience based on what you choose to share. So let's talk about that. Um, you know, Bitcoin sort of was your introduction, which I think is really interesting actually, that it's most people's introductions, or I guess if you were pre this last bull market, it was most people's introduction. And then people learn about different protocols and the develop, like there's not a lot of developers on Bitcoin right now, unfortunately, or just development. And so a lot of that happened on Ethereum. And so that's when you actually had that moment. You were like, wait, this feels human to me. This is relatable to me. And, and you were compelled to like get involved with the Ethereum community. I mean, really what I was compelled to was read. 
Yeah. And, you know, when I get excited about something, the first thing I want to do is try to understand it as best I can and then start practicing it with my own two hands. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, sort of around the time when I got really into this stuff, I was actually working out in Omaha. Uh, what for, year is this? Uh, so it was probably 2017. Okay. Um, when I, you know, really kind of turned up the heat on my, my love and enthusiasm for smart <laughs> contracts. But at the time, <laughs> I was commuting out to Omaha to work for the Oracle um, <laughs> and spent a lot of time at the water cooler in the office onboarding my colleagues at Berkshire Hathaway to Coinbase <laughs> to teach them how to buy crypto, um, which is sort of, you know, funny that, you know, that, that that was a, a place where we spent a lot of time talking about cryptocurrencies. It's not usually associated with that term. Um, <laughs> but the, the groundswell of enthusiasm and build energy was really what drew me into the, you know, into the crypto space full time. I love hackathons. I love building things. Even actually, it's funny, even, you know, when I travel now, I have like a little hardware kit with an Arduino board and NFC chips and electrical tape that I bring with me in my suitcase just for fun. Um, and so this <laughs> spirit of hundreds of people coming together just to build things and see what happens, like you can't help but want to be part of that. And so at first it was sort of a casual hobby. And then I realized, oh my gosh, you can go pro in this now. Yeah, You can have a job where you build out these protocol ecosystems. How cool is that? And so what was your water, jumping from leaving the water cooler with your good friends at Berkshire Hathaway to coming in and not asking for permission, but fully joining? Was it like your side hobby for a while and you were kind of just going to the hackathons and then living this sort of back and forth life? Or what was that situation where you were like, screw this, I'm, I'm gonna go do, wasn't called Web3 back then, but like crypto. <laughs> so. It was really, you know, it was a hobby and an interest of mine in the same way that some people like to play squash, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, or golf or something, I guess. Um, but really, you know, so, so a few, you know, former colleagues and friends of mine had started working um, full time at companies like Consensus. And I had the opportunity to meet Joe Lubin, spoke to him a few times and thought that the way that he viewed the future was really inspiring and compelling. And there was no fancy ivory tower that could give me the same sense of purpose that I had hearing mm -hmm. that opportunity. And so I left my, you know, suits in the closet and I started working in an apartment above a pizza shop in Bushwick. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot picture Evan in this suit, like just the color, like that would have just sucked the soul out of you. But I, I feel like nothing actually could detract from the enthusiasm that you just exude. But yeah, we're happy to have you now over on this side. So you, so you joined Consensus and you were at Consensus for how many years? For like four years and change. Yeah. Um, and you know, that was a magical experience, truly like you know, I, I think one day someone will tell the history of the development of Williamsburg, Brooklyn and the Ethereum <laughs> protocol and how the two grew up and around together. Um, it, you know, there's a, a really incredible window with many hundreds of interesting, talented people from all over the world putting their brains together to think, you know, what does it mean to build a protocol into an ecosystem? Um, so I had the opportunity to learn from and meet so many interesting people and, you know, get exposed to many projects, many of which don't even exist anymore. Um, but it was through that point of entry that I realized, you know, that I finally had a vantage point to see this incredible Web3 landscape that's often inaccessible to people on the outside who don't have the language or don't have the intimate access on an everyday basis. So moving into this last cycle, you decide to kind of take up that entrepreneurial spirit that was thrust upon you by so many predecessors of, you know, Elizabeth Stark and, and create Disco because you love data, Evan. You love data. Talk about your love for data. I love data. <laughs> I love data. If I think about it, you know, every movement that we make as human beings it, throughout our day, right? We are we are moving electrons. We are generating kinetic energy, and some of those movements get captured in a little piece of data, such as when we type on a keyboard that gets captured, you know, on screen. And sometimes that data just floats off into the ether, right? Mm -hmm. Such as maybe when we open or close a door or we put on our shoes. Mm -hmm. um, but we have an opportunity to capture so much more data than we do right now in a way that we can own and control and reuse. So think of how many times a year you fill out Eventbrite forms 
or partyful RSVPs or Luma or whatever those, you know, event RSVPs are, what if you could have autofill for everything? And so that's really what question we set forth to ask, how can we diminish the switching costs from one activity to another, moving from one app to another, physical space to digital space, so that we never have to fill out a form again. We can end onboarding and we can use these cool technologies to actually improve our daily lives instead of just playing casino. Yeah, so let's talk about this. You're, you call them data backpacks. Do you wanna explain like your data backpack? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, at, so sort of to back up a, a little bit, you know, to the way that we think about data and the world at Disco, we are very literal with the disco ball metaphor. Yeah. We believe that, you know, you, Aubrey, are the multifaceted center of the party, just as you are, and you should reflect your data and your identity to the world however you decide. So this means you need the ability to own that data, to control it, to decide what you want to share, and to take it with you. So you know, if we think about um, how a crypto wallet works, for example, you've got, you know, your wallet, you're able to control um, financial value with that wallet. It can go with you from one application or space to another, but it's just public financial information. Yeah, That's not everything that you need to go on an adventure. If I sent you on a 12-day hiking trip or mountain climbing trip and I only gave you your wallet full of credit cards, <laughs> you probably wouldn't have everything that you need for that adventure. And the same is true in digital space. If you can only carry your money with you from one app to another, then you're stuck filling out a form every time you show up to a new app. Our premise with data backpacks is that you can put your wallet into your backpack in the real world and carry everything you need from one place to another. And the same is true in Web3. You can take your existing Web3 wallet with your tokens you can affix storage, basically allow yourself to own and control more than just money with those very same keys. You can own and control any kind of data written about you and carry it with you anywhere you like. So your favorite color, your preference for light or dark mode, your preferred pronouns, your name, uh, your t-shirt size. All of this data is not appropriate, safe, or sometimes illegal to put on a blockchain but it can still be helpful to us to carry with us from one app to another, from one interaction to another. I think we've almost gotten so far away too from the this idea of privacy and, or just privacy, you know, um, of how, what, what we would choose to share, what we choose not to share. And I think a lot of times in the crypto space, uh, people assume privacy means nefarious activities, but it really just means, you know, I, I wanna have, choice over what is seen and not seen. And I, and I think, in, sadly, some Americans have totally lost their way on it. And when you talk about privacy, privacy points, or just anything privacy in Web3, it's automatically negative. And I think what you're talking about and, and what Disco is is really interesting because, I mean, if you're not using this technology, you can receive things that you don't want to receive that is on-chain forever and that you are associated with. And so right now there's a lot of problems that need to be solved in this area. Can you talk about that to people who are like, why would I need to, why would I need my data backpack? Why would I need to consent to the things that I own? Can you share a little bit on that? For sure. So often and more often these days, we'll hear about uh, you know, folks suggesting, why don't we put everything on a blockchain? Medical records on a blockchain, <laughs> passports on a blockchain. Um, and, you know, it's also important for us to remember blockchains sell block space. Yeah. Their job is to get as much data as possible onto those blockchains. And it's also important for us to remember that we live in a society where there are rules and you are not allowed to do just whatever you would like with other people's data. Um, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg would say differently, but we will, we will come back to that a different yeah. day. Mark, you and I can talk about that later. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, in, in the United States and in the EU and Canada and Brazil and Japan, there are laws that govern what you are allowed to do with other people's data, the data that describes them, personally identifiable information like your name, picture of you. Um, and additionally, there are other types of data that, that are sort of restricted or governed in, um, you know, with, with laws that we need to be aware of data that describes children under the age of 13, mm -hmm. um, you know, data that pertains to medical information or trade secrets. Um, so when we take these laws that control what you are and are not allowed to do with data, and we combine them with public and immutable databases, 
that have no take backsies, we find ourselves at an interesting impasse. Um, you know, blockchains are equal opportunity surveillance platforms. They are open APIs that anyone can access. And so um, abiding by the law and publishing all data on a blockchain is, you know, fundamentally incongruous. So if we want a street legal way to do more than just pool capital in Web3 with our crypto wallets, we need a safe and compliant manner to store data about us that can change and evolve because we're human beings. We're not fixed and public and permanent. And, you know, also allows us to, to your point, have consent. So privacy is a funny word because it's really vague, right? Privacy mm. is a static end state that happens after you give consent or, you know, or an action is taken that either complies with or violates your consent. Mm. So really what we're talking about when we talk about privacy is the act of consent that happens beforehand mm. to make something no longer private. You know, privacy is the cornerstone of civilized society. Mm. Privacy allows us to have freedom of religion, of assembly, Privacy is the reason we have bathroom doors. Yeah. And so it is important for us to reconcile the right of consent and you know the inherent humanity of how we show up in the world yeah. with trustless systems that wish to beat the humanity out of human interaction. And I think consent over data, because I think people for a while, and even myself, I got guilty of this and got you know, tired. There, there was sort of like a web two click solution to on that one click solution of, of letting Google put whatever email address or connecting via your Facebook account because people don't want to sit there and sign up for forms every single time. Um, but people didn't understand by doing that what kind of data that they're giving away and they were not reading those things. So it's like consent over data people have totally not understood. I would say for most of the 2000s and, and it's 2023 now for so over 20 years people have been very confused on their rights over their data and honestly a lot of people have been violated and um i i would love to hear your thoughts on that and just how we almost speak to the public about getting their rights back or even teaching them about the rights that they have because they feel like pretty much big brother surveillance state a lot of people do in america so we as Americans have never had the experience of controlling our data before it goes to someone else. Yeah. In the United States, data is the business asset owned by the app where it is created. Yeah. In the European Union, data is a right of the body, an extension of yourself, dignified work product that you create in the course of your labor. So in the U.S., data is a business asset owned by apps. In the EU, it is labor owned by the person who, who created it. So in these constructs, there are very different ways that it gets treated, different rights that it's extended. Um, and we don't really know what that's going to look like. But I think in the future, we will see this time in history as a moment when the American government forgot us refuse to recognize our dignified labor and compensate it, and instead allowed for enterprises to take advantage of their user bases. I think one of the great opportunities that we have here is to discuss what consent actually is. Mm -hmm. So for the last decade plus, as you've noted, we have had to ch check boxes to provide consent, but I would not call that informed, enthusiastic, affirmative consent. Only a hell yes is a yes when it comes to people touching your physical body. And, and it should be the overall, same for data. And just overall, if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. That's just a life advice, piece of life advice. Continue. <laughs> Absolutely. If it's not a hell yes, it's a no. And you wouldn't let, you know, random strangers be able to have access to your person. So why do we allow that for our data? One of the things that I think a lot about is how can we build systems in the Web3 space that minimize risk and harm to human beings? So, you know, when I used to work on designs for things like cars and toothbrushes, we had a bunch of rules that basically said, here's what you're allowed to build and here's what you're not, because we know that some choices harm people. So, for example, we would never try to build a car that had no airbags or that had no seatbelts. And 
in the Web3 space, there are very few sets of parameters that help guide us to minimize the harm that we can do to other people. Uh, the discipline of design justice or evaluating the consequences of what you create on different marginalized communities is all but absence, absent in Web3, although it's certainly something that we are working hard to learn more about and put into practice at Disco. When I think about the way that we can do better by human beings and contemplate consent as part of their experience is to look beyond the chain for some rules that you know others might have created before us. So as we were saying, you know, public blockchains are equal opportunity surveillance platforms. They are no consent environments, meaning if I have your public key, I can map anything to it that I want and the whole world can see. Everyone on earth and in space with an internet connection for all time. And it can be difficult to tell whether that was wanted or unwanted, whether I gifted it to you or I'm trying to bully you. Mm. And so it is important for us to incorporate consent, to contemplate what it means for these networks to be public, and to think about what that permanence, you know, sort of does for us, yeah. um, whether or not it is useful and helpful. So to the rules, um, I recommend everybody check out The Seven Laws of Identity, published by Kim Cameron, who led the identity practice at Microsoft. Uh, this was from 2005. Um, so this set of rules basically helps us to design identity systems that minimize risk and harm to human beings. Um, some of those rules include things like minimum disclosure. Mm -hmm. Minimum disclosure means that your data should be shared on a need to know basis. Mm -hmm. So if someone else does not need to know your data, it should not be given to them freely without restriction. Public ledgers prevent your ability to consent by making the data that they, you know, display, hold, share, emit publicly available to all. So if you want to void your consent, if you want to forfeit consent, you can put data on a public blockchain. It almost gives me, I, I made a meme of this years ago where it was talking about like millennials trying to look for jobs. And it was like, don't post pictures with red solo cups. You know what I mean? Because it, Back when we were applying for jobs, you're like, anything you put on the internet, you don't know what, how that's going to be used against you in the future. And now it almost feels like anything you put on chain, you have no idea what the implications. It's almost like that that meme or that like trope has been reinvented. But instead of just Web 2, it's now Web 3. Whatever you put on chain, be careful because you don't know what the future looks like. And a lot of times that can't be, not that it can always be scrubbed on Web 2, but it definitely can't get scrubbed on Web3 for some of those immutable chains. So uh, scary, like very scary for people who don't understand the implications of it and just don't understand that there's just public blockchains. Like people think sometimes of blockchains, it's like, oh, it's secret. Like, no, bro. Like, do you not understand the tech? So everything you've done, every transaction, if you signed off on that, it's your signature. I would I, love it's to. It's amazing. I'm sorry. I <laughs> I'm just sorry, get sorry. sometimes no, no, no. like, I get like, there's been things that have happened recently where I'm like, are you, are you, do you understand the tech or do you not understand the tech? People get caught up in situations and it's, I'm going to stop myself right there. Sometimes I, <laughs> you know, sometimes I like to ask people, okay, so, you know, picture your grandchildren. They're gathered around the fireplace with your kids. This is, you know, many, <laughs> many years from now, maybe your great grandchildren. We're no longer around. This is our you know, distant relatives in the future, they're gathering around the fireplace to review the timestamps of grandma's porn consumption and what she was watching at what time. <laughs> and, and you said this on a panel, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. That, you know, it's important for us to think about what kind of transactions and interactions. You this to a guy, who did you say this to? <laughs> Who did you say? My dear friend, Kelvin, from the Optimism team, who is a thoughtful and smart guy. You know, we had the opportunity to talk about what should go on chain and what should not. And I think it's important for us to think about if something goes on chain, do you feel comfortable with your great grandchildren looking at it? Does that make you feel good and proud? And if it doesn't, maybe we should contemplate whether a blockchain is a good place for that. You know, an another way to, um, to think about this is, you know, you might ask someone, would you be comfortable going on a first date? you know, splitting the bill on that day, it doesn't go so well. And then allowing that person to see your Venmo transactions till you die. God. That's a blockchain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awful, scary. We're not really 
you know, rooting for own, our own cause right now. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> I think, I actually think that blockchains are wonderful, beautiful, incredible networks, but it makes me sad that sometimes we use them for suboptimal purposes. Well, use cases are bad. When strictly, yeah. let's go back to that. Like strictly financial use cases of basically what it's been so far. Blockchains are lit for timestamps. Incredible timestamp machine. Phenomenal world class. <laughs> you know, blockchains are an outstanding way to have verifiable scarcity, to tell that this token ID in this contract address, this combo is unique and specific to, you know, to this particular asset. And, you know, they introduced the idea of digital rival goods. That's so cool. But if your data does not need to be globally available to everyone on earth and in space forever, if your data needs to change and evolve, if your data is not beholden to a single protocol, but needs to be used in more than one protocol ecosystem, if your data, you know, needs to have a layer of consent or multiple parties that can, you know, control it, then a public ledger might not be a good solution. It might actually be a technically poor fit for what you're trying to do. So my enthusiasm for all this technology comes from solving problems for people and so it's, I think, I think it's really important for us to practice human-centered design, not protocol-centered design. Like what problem do we solve for people, not what science fair project can we create when we throw <laughs> this code together? Well, I, what you were just saying too about, we don't design cars without airbags and we need boundaries and we need guidelines and we need some sort of framework to then build upon. Um, it's in this space, it feels like there hasn't been clear guidance from the U.S. regulators. And I don't know if you saw the Gensler hearing or just clips of it, but it's it's getting increasingly more frustrating that we cannot identify if Ethereum is a security and what that means and even just provide guidance overall on this entire industry. It's really hard for entrepreneurs such as yourself to be getting involved. Does that stress you out? How do you feel about that? I welcome the opportunity to have this conversation. I am grateful that even though the conversation may be frustrating, that it is happening. And I think that the most important thing that entrepreneurs who feel, you know, impacted by or have an opinion on this conversation, the most important thing we can do is show up. We can talk about governance until we're blue in the face in Web3, but if we do not participate in our government in the places where we live, we have no right to complain. So at Disco, we are proud to work with regulators to help them understand and learn about these technologies. We work you know, with both sort of private sector entities, public sector entities, academic institutions to be part of that conversation. So you know, as these discussions roll out, securities really you know, don't apply to us at Disco with our off-chain data, but data sovereignty laws, um, you know, data ownership and, and citizen identity all pertains to our work. Uh, I was really excited actually recently when I saw the new White House cybersecurity mandate that includes section 5.4 for those reading at home, um, <laughs> that uh, includes a mandate for a new digital identity system for Americans that can interoperate between public and private systems. And so, what I'm seeing from some parts of the government is a call for partnership. And it is up to us to decide whether we want to be sore losers and complain that some people aren't speaking in a way that we like, or do we want to show up to the call and, and help our partners in government to do better? And so when you see, I mean, obviously you guys don't have a token at Disco, but it's something that you are probably interested in following. Like, does it not bother you that Gary Gensler, who taught at MIT crypto courses for years, says he, he never used it and is regulating on this? I mean, he can't obviously use it now, um, but he he claims when he was testifying that he's never even, like, used crypto at all. And so it's very frustrating, in my opinion, but, like, how do you educate people who are honestly just, like, boomers just sitting there and they're they're appointed by the president. Like, it just feels like the, these pe the people didn't even vote these people in. It's just so frustrating for the American people. And then regulation doesn't seem to really come. And then he filibusters and he sits there. Sorry, I'm, this is my personal opinions, but I'm getting very frustrated because I would like to see something happen. And it doesn't seem like it's going to happen right now with the Senate divided. I hear you. And what we need to do is we need to show up. We need to 
be active and communicate with the local places throughout our country where this conversation is affected, not just at the federal level, whether that is our state governments, whether that is, you know, the curriculum that students are going through before they, you know, grow up to work as Hill staffers, or whether that (laughs) is, you know, in the actual DC environment itself. And so the answer for us when we feel frustrated or unclear when people who should be good teachers are not showing up for us as their students, we need to keep showing up. So speaking of the state level, do you think that there will be some sort of legislation? Would you think that this will, um, like crypto adoption will come through state level first before it comes through like the federal, federal government? Or is that what you're kind of saying? Or do you, what do you think? I think that crypto as in cryptography is already being embraced at the state level in many different ways. Yeah. We see some of our amazing partners, such as Spruce ID, working with the state of California to help secure you know, the data that is relevant in that context in a way that is does not involve a public ledger you know, in a traditional sense, but still uses these securing technologies. Um, I'm excited by the progressive ideas around small and medium-sized business growth in you know, different places across the country at the state level. And I think that Local government is where we experience our nation, where we have an opportunity Mm -hmm. to have a touch point and influence. And so I think it is likely to be in response to what is happening in communities across the country that we start to see larger change in Washington. You know, indeed, for Congress people, they listen to their constituents. So if we are not going to where those constituents are to invite them in the conversation, how can we ever ask them to have this as a priority? Do you think crypto will become a political issue? Like it is not inherently so, but do you think that it's going to become more divisive? I think that all systems built by human beings are inherently political. Now, fortunately, public ledgers are feminist protocols. They act the same regardless of the gender expression of their users, but it is simply the human layer and the applications that they've built on top that gatekeep this from everybody, make it hard to use, use complex language to keep other people out. We have an opportunity to separate use cases, such as currencies, from the underlying math that is cryptography. You know, math is not particularly opinionated, but the way that we assemble it together and we use it in our lives is. And so, of course, these platforms and applications will be politicized because of the bias and nature of the people who build them. And so if we bias ourselves toward serving human beings and not toward personal enrichment, if we bias ourselves, you know, toward lawfulness and, you know, problem solving first, I think that we will put everyone in a better position to use these technologies and embrace them as we did the early internet. Hell of an answer. Hell of an answer. I have to switch his gears to Taylor Swift because we will go on for a three-hour <laughs> podcast if we continue. Um, okay. We got in this conversation this weekend. We were talking. We, we, we somehow always bring up Taylor Swift and her Swifties. But, like, I think it is such a good example of audiences, communities, and cults. But specifically, Taylor Swift sort of has her own doubt and she doesn't know it yet. Would you agree? Agreed completely. I think the Swifties are the greatest semi-centralized DAO on the face of the planet and all of Web3 (laughs) should take note. And I think you put it best because you you wrote this paper, right? Talking about, do you want to explain it? Like, oh my gosh. So, you know, sometimes when I get really excited about an idea, I'll start right, I'll start reading a lot and then I'll start writing. And so a few years ago, <laughs> I sort of wrote this this goofy little set of ideas. I'll have to see if I can find it. Um, uh, trying to understand how, <laughs> uh, you know, communities around artists create sort of self-sustaining, economically productive activity. So I started looking at artists like Taylor Swift and learning about K-pop bands like Blackpink. And I realized they all kind of had three things in common in terms of the activities that their fans do that are super valuable. You know, they um, fans of Taylor Swift and and artists like this, um, they will buy everything they sell, meaning that they purchase the music. They will embrace the ideas, the trends, the stylings, the colors, the phrases and inside jokes. 
they will defend the brand. So if anyone is, you know, bullying online or being negative, they will ardently defend and, and support in a positive way their, you know, their brand, their Taylor Swift or Blackpink. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll evangelize. They'll get their friends to join the gang and do the same. And so this sort of self-perpetuating, self-scaling experience is a hard thing to spark. But some of the ways that they've been able to do it are, you know, creating places of psychological safety and shared experiences that don't cost a lot, kind of a freemium model of, of belonging, of a mm. feeling of belonging. Yeah. And then, you know, welcoming people into a space where there are different ways to interact, whether it's on social media, listening to music, um, attending shows, buying merchandise, et cetera. But the sort of shared intimacy that mm. everyone has through these activities creates a really interesting set of community dynamics. I think it's interesting too, because I think it really speaks to identity, right? Like Taylor Swift Swifties call themselves a Swiftie. And when you, going back to the things you were saying, they defend the brand, they defend the person. It's almost like they're defending themselves too and their values. And so it it speaks to like this deeper level of, I'm just a, a subscriber of a show to I'm a fan. I show up to every single thing because I am part of this group. I am part of this community. And in Web3, we throw around community all the time. But it's like, do people really have communities that they feel like they identify with? And I think that's been so interesting because a lot of the Web2, I don't want to call Taylor Swift Web2, sorry, Mm -hmm. Um, but like kind of, that is her community, but they actually go hard. And like people like Mr. Beast, you were saying, for example, and there's a ton of other people, K-pop fans that will, they live and die by these leaders, these groups. And I think it's really, really interesting. What's weird in the crypto space is that we kind of do it backwards. (laughs) Is it weird or is it like- Unexpected, (laughs) odd, bizarre, I don't know. So make things more difficult you know, as ever. So, um, you know, when we think about artists like Taylor Swift, right, you know, they, they curate a sense of belonging in their audience. So when, when I say audience, I mean, you know, a a crowd of people who gather to hear content, receive content from the same person. Um, hi audience today. Um, (laughs) and then when we think about community, I think a lot about those sort of lateral interactions between people. You've got a group of people who I have a shared pursuit and it is through the shared experience of pursuing that thing or, or being part of that, that shared experience that they develop a shared identity. We did the same thing. We both had the same goal and we worked toward it uh, in parallel. Um, and then when you think about a cult, that's really sort of the formalization of, you know, a uh, uh, charismatic leader and a exclusionary language and onboarding ritual and, you know, taking advantage of your, exit liquidity or, or sorry, you know, members or whatever. Um, so it's important for us to think, you know, in the crypto space, we're bringing a bunch of people together to coordinate human coordination tools. We're implying that they're a community, what we call them on discord, but what brings them together are financial transactions for the most part. And if you're investing financially Financial investment's the only form of contributions recognized, but you're also investing emotionally. Things get weird. Yeah. Well, I had this conversation with Richard Kim actually last summer at some place in Cannes. Josh, you were there. We talked about this. We were talking about um, community and how you really can't have, community is a a group with a shared value system. And when you introduce um, financial aspects or components, components of it, it kind of mars it a bit because then there's like a bit of corruption and greed and sway. And obviously there are things like this exist, like churches, right? But like, we're not gonna go down that road, but, but like, yes, that is still a thing, you know? And so it's hard to have authentic community as much as we wanna call it a community. Something that would be a truer community would be, or a cult, also a little religious component to that, but like is a Taylor Swift group, which is traditional. It's not like she tried to build a community and then became a singer. She was a singer and then built a community. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, well, so- and that order matters. <laughs> we do not, you know, get in a group <laughs> it's chat. It's so obvious that it matters. Yeah, it's like, like everyone's you know, doing it. So Taylor Swift, in, you know, creates music <laughs> and builds joy in the people who listen to it and then invites them to buy things, right? (laughs) Whereas in the crypto space, we invite people to buy things and then find an emotional attachment to 
the financial assets they just got, right? <laughs> I would not throw some random dudes from Texas and North Carolina and Wyoming in a group chat and say we're homies <laughs> simply because we all own U.S. dollars. <laughs> like money <laughs> is for interacting with people you don't trust. And so it's a strange <laughs> gathering point as the basis of a community. Indeed, we do not have the data we need about each other to have communities in Web3, right? Like, So what are you trying to say, Evan, that like people shouldn't like, <laughs> so Bitcoin can't be a cult because it's actually just parallel to cash. Well, no, no. It's kind of true though, Bit but it's kind of Bitcoin true. is an incredible cult because it has <laughs> an absent charismatic leader. And so it is a sort of decentralized headless cult in that way. Okay. I think that the ritual and language and belief system around the protocol give people a sense of belonging, of shared experience and pursuit. But, we like, but like there's not cash conferences. Unless Cash Up has a conference that I don't know about, there are not. I mean, are you know, salt. All right. <laughs> like there, are, you know, there are Forex conferences, I'm sure. But the funny thing about making a community- But do you identify as a casher? Isn't that weird, right? Like, so what we've done is we have created an emotional sense of belonging around an asset that doesn't inherently have one because we need to meme it into being. In order to achieve something like building the pyramids or the Bitcoin protocol, you need to have the willful suspension of disbelief that you can upend the way the universe works. And so it is through that shared sense- A lot of egos around Yeah, here. shared sense of belonging <laughs> that you can build what, previously was conceived to be impossible through sheer force of will. And I think that, you know, sense of enthusiasm and possibility and belonging is what brings a lot of people together. But we have to remember that being cashers, you know, that cannot be like the be all end all, right? We are here to do more than have a party where we can only throw money at each other. We're here to build more than just dating apps, like that only display how much money you have, right? Because that's the only type of thing you could build based on a, based on a public ledger today. So true, like, true. you know, yeah. if I, if the only thing I know about you is your public key, yeah. you are not my friend, Aubrey. You are not my, you know, podcast host role model. You are a pile of tokens, not a person. Mm. And if we bring a bunch of people together into a room and all we know is their addresses, the only thing we can be is a group chat with a bank account, like a centralized group chat with a decentralized bank account. And if we want to plan a party together, we don't know who's a party planner, what state people live in, what language they speak, right? If we want to write a newsletter together, we don't know who's done that before. And so if we want to solve more interesting coordination problems than playing casino or open sea collection management, then we need more data about each other. So, so rounding back out to Taylor Swift's DAO, what, if you had to give her one pitch to join web three because we know our girl taylor she turned down that 100 million dollar deal from sam bankman fried saying you know are these unregistered securities just just never girl does never she never flops she never has a flop era really proud of that um but what would be your pitch to taylor for getting her because she probably has a taste bad taste in her mouth and she feels like she probably has a w on crypto right now but if we had to get her back in like what would be your pitch Evan, to, to t-swift T. I'm so excited <laughs> we're having this conversation. So glad that you made time. Thank you so much. Aubrey and I are really glad you're here. So here's our thought. We have been living in the Taylorverse for many years. You have hidden hints and presents for us in your outfits, your album liner notes, your documentary footage and notes on social media. And it is time for us to tie all of those elements together and live our lives like the great Taylor Swift scavenger hunt video game where every action that we take could have some relevance into Taylor's metaverse, where we should be able to find other Swifties, go on great adventures, solve problems and mysteries and do activities that benefit our community, our Swifty community, without having to over publicize ourselves, to let businesses abuse our data. You know, Taylor, I know that you are aware of how enterprises can misuse intellectual property and data to the detriment of female entrepreneurs like yourself. Scooter Braun. And so <laughs> we are really excited about building a more equitable future for Swifties where they don't wait in lines and they don't fill out forms, where they're able to 
you know, be participants in their community, to support one another, and to use their reputation to earn privileges and capabilities, not just their money. We are here to build a Taylor Swift enabled future that requires no explanation because there is only reputation. Bro, no <laughs> way, no way. Taylor, we love you. <laughs> Integrating songs and lyrics, dude, Evan, we need you running. We need you to be run for office. Blockchains are feminist protocols. We are here <laughs> to enable the Taylor Swift metaverse. We think that it is critical for everyone to be able to participate. And it's very important for us to also remember that just because your keys come from a blockchain, you don't need to fund your wallet to use them. There is no price requirement to be part of Web3 in the future. And if anyone tells you that, they're trying to keep you out. The... God, I, I love that we have you in the private sector, but I would really <laughs> like to get you in the public sector. I know that's not convincing enough on a paycheck, but something that I think we should look into for you. Don't that is so kind of you, Abs. Something you know, new. I actually have been involved in local politics since I was a kid. Of course. Um, so <laughs> my, if you ever watched the, do you ever watch the TV show Parks and Rec? Yes. So my mom is kind of like Leslie Nope. Oh, I love like that. Like she, you know, oversees the road department and the spring egg hunt and breakfast with Santa. And so. What's her, what's her role? She is the township trustee. Oh, um, So that. That we don't have a mayor because, you know, it's a really small town. But when <laughs> I was a kid, the way that I learned Facebook ads was that I started running online ads for my mom's reelection campaigns. So she wow. was the first in our county to use, you know, online display ads and Facebook ads. Um, and so by participating in, you know, local politics, learning about the way that, you know, people interact with their constituents, that really helped me understand that showing up does matter when it comes to our elected officials. It really does. And I know someone who would show up every day. So I'm, and I would be your campaign manager. I'm trying to get a job as Evan's campaign manager. I, I, I don't know what role we could even put you in because you're qualified for too many, but we'll figure this out. If you would like Evan to run for office, please comment below because I think we need her. I'm not kidding. Did you, oh my gosh, did you hear the Taylor Swift? Like that was just off on the fly. Like, are you kidding me? You know, one of the- Like Biden can't even read the, the cards in front of him and you're just ripping speeches. Aubrey, I appreciate that so much because sometimes people <laughs> bully me and tell me that I speak like a robot or that they think no, that I'm don't. reading off a script all the time. So I appreciate that. No, no, we need people that can actually make speeches. And I mean, you don't have time to do speeches. You have your own speech writers in the future, but I feel like you wouldn't be that type. I feel like you would be just just kind of free balling it in the best way, not in the Trump way, not to get this political, but like, you know, when Trump would go off the script, you would be doing that in a good way, in like a cool way. You know, at any <laughs> at any point in my life, at any time, uh, you know, now or in the future, I'm always excited to talk about verifiable data. And actually, I think you've seen me do this a few times. I So we kind of have this joke on my team that we call GitHub in the club. <laughs> where like I will go out to parties. I like, I'm not a huge parties person, but when I have to go out to parties, like I will talk to people about verifiable data. So there are like pictures of me standing on the table in clubs at four o'clock in the morning, like going through GitHub code repositories on my phone and explaining to people like how signatures work. And we have found so many partners that way. In fact, we have a bunch of rock stars and DJs who have, you know, are, are partners and supporters and investors who I explained verifiable data to like in the DJ booth at a club. And so I think that identity and verifiable data is the most fun thing you could possibly talk about anywhere, anytime. I mean, you are that <laughs> meme of the guy at the club yes. screaming into, but it's instead of a girl. Or like the girl at the study, festival. Yeah, it's <laughs> screaming. That is you. That's me. That's you, That's but me. we need to reverse the genders on that or keep it whatever the same. Gender like, is a spectrum. You know, expression is a spectrum. Yeah. I accept the meme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you are that meme. Okay, Evan, tell me what is big did energy to you? What does that mean? Ah, uh, yes, big did energy. So DID, decentralized identity, something that I care a lot about. Basically, decentralized identity means that you own and control your identity. You're not not renting it from someone else. Um, so for example, like your Gmail, you rent that from Google, your Twitter, you rent that from Twitter, your you know license, you rent that from the DMV. Like you don't really own all that much by yourself. Um, so big DID, big did energy, that's the real BDE we need. But it is the magic of self-ownership and self-custody that reminds us that, you know, we can own more than money. We can own our whole asses. <laughs> 
But let's talk about that energy that you that you are putting out into the world. Is this big? Is this big did energy? Oh, this is big did energy all the time. So I think that identity is the most fun thing you could possibly work on. And like, I mean that seriously. Yeah. Like every single one of us has had an identity since the day we were born. Yeah. You are the world's expert in being Aubrey, right? And so it should make sense that you should have the world's best information about you and you should be able to take it with you. Not some like random dude who made an app that you use sometimes, which is what's happening right now. So, you know, your identity has informed every interaction you've ever had for your whole life and will continue to do so. And also be allowed to change in your identity too, correct? Like if you're not the Evan that used to wear suits, you're Evan that wears, this is this is big dead energy now. <laughs> and so if you want to cut your hair, dye your hair, be, be a different person, change your job, change your hobbies, change your interests, um, I feel like that should be something that also is available to people to be able to, people are not just these stagnant things. They're not, humans are human. Yeah, right? humans are human. Like one of the beautiful principles of individualism is that we have the ability to change and evolve, right? We are not defined by any single choice in our lives. And we always have the ability to, you know, to continue on that path of change. We are not fixed and public and permanent in our existence. You know, I'm pretty sure your listeners probably wouldn't want to apply to all of their future jobs with their 2008 MySpace profiles, right? We, we have permission to show up differently in different parts of our lives, whether that is church with our family or four o'clock in the morning at a club talking about verifiable data. And so we need our data to reflect how we are as people if we want to build human-centered systems. Like blockchains are built for coordinating computers. Addresses are not meant for representing people. And so we need to build out that technology so we can show up as our full selves, right? Like, I love it. you remember yeah. that movie Fight Club? You are more <laughs> than the contents of your wallet. And, you know, you need a data backpack in order to have more than just money with you to go on your adventures. Um, a print in your apartment is fuck around and find out. Yes. So <laughs> it's a little, a little funny. So, you know, people often ask, like, how do you test these products? Like, how do you get feedback on something that's new that people have never touched before? And I jokingly, not jokingly say, we well, fuck around and find out. You got to give it a try. And so years and years ago, I was at, I was getting breakfast at the Tartine Manufacturing in San Francisco <laughs> with one of my friends from school. And um, I bought this beautiful little print that says, fuck around and find out. And I hung it on my wall and it sat in the background as I met with investors and pitched our company. And they would ask, what is that? I said, that is our product testing strategy. We talk to people, we show up, we listen, we learn, and we find out. And the fuck around part, you know, it's a reminder that we need to approach all of this with joy and curiosity and humility that we don't know. We are learning. We are literally just fucking around. <laughs> <laughs> it's like encapsulate this whole space. We're just fucking around, hopefully in the best way. Like there's some people who fucked around and found out Alameda Research that was was not in the best way, but we're fucking around in a good way. We're trying to we're trying to do good things here. Yeah, and that's why it's important for us to set boundaries and respect yes. those boundaries. It's why it's important for us to center the people that we serve. Like, you know, people who work in the technology, product development, protocol development space, we are in the service industry. We serve people. And if we develop hubris to think that we are not somehow, you know, that we are better than that, that we are not, oh, we are not building toward the service of humans, but rather some other goal, then we will lose our opportunity. We were talking about at brunch the other day, and you were saying that um, because we don't have clear boundaries, oh, people schema can, docs, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, so this is this is a really important thing. So. As we were talking about earlier, there are laws in places like the United States and in Europe that govern what you're allowed to do with data about people. So for example, if your company keeps track of someone's mailing address, their home address, and that person calls you and asks you to delete it, if that person lives in the state of California or in the European Union, you have to delete that data or you could be violating a law. And so if you publish something like a home address and clear text on a public blockchain, you know, on behalf of a user, 
and that person asks you to take it down and you can't, that means you're breaking a law and you can't remedy it in the way that was expected. And so that's, you know, that's harmful. That's risky. In fact, I think probably, you know, all of your female identifying users would not feel comfortable publishing their home address publicly, mm. that that could be risky or harmful. So generally as a, as a practice, you know, a lot of us have a visceral reaction to that. But furthermore, there you know, are rules that say what we can and cannot do here. And so I think as builders, if we are providing documentation or tools that guide people to touch data that is controlled by these laws, data about people, we need to also remind them of what the consequences are for handling that. So for example, you know, there is, there's some documentation floating out around there that tells people how to, for example, take in a, uh, tells builders how to take in a home address and put it in a data schema and publish it on a public blockchain. And that, depending on where those people live, could be illegal and unsafe. Um, and so again, it's really important for us to think about what are the consequences of what we're building here? Is this legal and safe? Will this harm marginalized communities further? So what it, we've, we've kind of talked about all sort of intersections um, of like, yes, getting excited about owning your own data, but then also like having entrepreneurs and builders, you know, provide guidance, but then can they provide guidance or do you want regulators to provide guidance? Like what is the solution here for all of these things? Because it feels like there needs to, someone needs to take control of this situation, which we're kind of at a standstill. I completely agree. I think there is a great opportunity for us to latch onto the regular regulatory clarity around um, non-financial data. So we, you know, we've got a pretty awesome runway to explore there. I think that when it comes to builders, it is our job to not make people become protocol experts. I think that it is elitist and exclusionary to use really technical design and really technical language to keep other people out. Ponzi schemes don't work with a billion users, and so there's an economic incentive to prevent the whole world from coming to Web3. I think it's really important for us to not only solve problems for people in a way that they can access, but also to create systems that are sustainable and regenerative. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to the, the sort of consequences of, you know, who needs to provide this clarity, we all do. But we all need to remember that we are providing this clarity in service of human beings. Um, you know, we like to say on our team that designers will inherit the metaverse because when we're all working off of shared backends, we must compete with front end design to offer the best possible experience. And that is the future that we need to focus on and work toward that, you know, we do not need to create more labor for human beings because we are too lazy to build apps that they can reasonably use. I love it so much. Um, any final, any final thoughts, any final words, anything that you want to, you didn't get to say that you want to say? This is the year of fun in Web3. We have learned, millions of us, how to manage public and private key, key pairs. Some of us have figured out how to fund them, how to perform financial interactions. But all of the actions, the data that makes you, you, outside of your money, this is the moment when we're ready to welcome all of Aubrey into Web3, right? All of, you know, the traits and preferences and capabilities that you have and to start building trust minimized interactions based on those things. So instead of just group chats with bank accounts, we are going to build products. We are going to plan parties. We are going to educate the world in ways that they have never felt before. And we're going to create experiences that center on joy and value. Um, and the way that we're going to do that is we are going to, uh, we are going to center our designs around human beings. So at Disco, we're you know particularly excited about uh, about all of these different adventures that we can go on together. Um, you know, if you guys have a moment and you want to set up a data backpack of your own, visit us at disco.xyz, or you can follow us on Twitter at disco.xyz. I'm always uh, open for DMs and metaverse dreams at Proven Authority, and would welcome any ideas that you know your squad has for how we can make a gas-free, verifiable data future <laughs> accessible to everyone including the Bitcoin squad. Yes, I love it so much, Evan. Thank you so much for coming on The Observation. I feel like we're going to have to do a round two very soon because we could go all day, but it's been such an honor to have you on the podcast and I'm so glad that we got to be able to do it. So 
Thank you for coming on. Of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. It, the honor is all mine and I look forward to seeing you in the metaverse. Love it. Love it. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of The Observation. We'll be back next time. Good luck and Godspeed. You don't